All right, so there isn't a lot of value yet that we found with self-esteem, but that raises another question. Why do people care about self-esteem? We know that they do. Uh, why did nature design us to care about something that has so little value? One answer is that even though self-esteem itself might not matter that much, maybe it's, maybe it's basically something that keeps track of something that is important. It could be like the gas gauge on your automobile. The gas gauge tells you how much petrol is left in the tank. The gauge itself does nothing for making the car move. So the gauge is like self-esteem. It doesn't drive it, it doesn't steer it, it doesn't do anything here. But it's a measure of something that is very important, namely whether you're about to run out of petrol. Uh, self-esteem could be a measure of whether other people will like you. Now that does matter in evolutionary history. Uh, it's something that we evolved to do is to get along with other people. As human beings, we cooperate with each other, we're part of social groups. Being part of the social group is a key to survival and reproduction, which are the, the criteria of evolution. So we have to be concerned about our reputations, about being the sort of person that other people want to be with, want to hire, want to marry, want to invite to a party, and so on. So self-esteem is kind of our internal measure, our monitor uh, of Oh, whether we are appealing to others, do they like us, will they like us, do we have social acceptance, uh, and also social status. Nature doesn't care at all what your opinion of yourself is. Self-esteem has very little direct bearing on survival and reproduction. Uh, in contrast, uh, what other people think of you, that matters a lot. Self-esteem is part of that process of enabling you to keep track of what others think of you or presumably what they should think of you. Now let's go back for a minute to self-deception, to uh, thinking you're better uh, than you really are. I mean, is that really a good idea? In practical terms, self-deception seems risky. You want to base your decisions on reality. If you overestimate how good you are at math, say, and you sign up for an advanced mathematics class, well, you're going to fail. Uh, by the same token, if you overestimate your uh, physical uh, attractiveness and sex appeal and you go trying to uh, strike up a conversation or start a relationship with some utterly gorgeous member of the opposite sex, they're just going to reject you. It doesn't work. But self-deception may be helpful toward uh, fooling others to think well of you. In my opinion, one of the most creative and important papers on self-deception in the last 10 or 15 years was written by one of the professors here at University of Queensland, Professor w William von Hippel. He started with social influence. We benefit if we can persuade others to do what we want them to do. Telling them things is helpful toward that. Of course, we could lie, tell them what we need them to think to do that, what we want them to do, but they might get skilled at spotting lies. People are good at, at, at recognizing if you're, you're, you're faking or lying or distorting. So uh, if you know you're lying, it can make it difficult to sell the message you want. But if you get yourself to believe it, uh, you believe what you're saying, you can convince yourself, then you can do a better job of convincing other people. So self-deception ultimately may become a means toward persuading others. You want other people to think well of you, and so if you think favorably about yourself, you'll be able to present yourself to others in a way that will look good to them, and that matters a whole lot. Then they're more likely to accept you and include you in their groups. I think this is a key, profound insight uh, that we fool ourselves in order to fool others, because to get others to look upon us favorably, that's tremendously important.